First off, there are not enough words to describe how awesome this movie is. Like I said before, Star Trek 2 is to this day still considered by many to be the best Star Trek movie, not to mention one of the best sci-fi movies ever made. Of course, Rotten Tomatoes says differently, saying that Star Trek 2009 is the best, with a 94% critic score compared to 86% for Wrath of Khan, making it the third highest rated Star Trek movie on Rotten Tomatoes behind 2009 and First Contact the only really good TNG movie with 93%. However, Wrath of Khan has a 90% audience score, making it the second highest rated Star Trek movie according to the audience, again behind 2009, which has a 91% score, with First Contact coming in third. But many lists usually put Wrath of Khan at the top, and it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to see why. For one thing, Star Trek II remains to this day a textbook example of how you can do a visual effects studded extravaganza on a reduced budget, which was one of the biggest issues with the last Star Trek movie, Star Trek The Motion Picture. Another thing is that again, opposed to the last Star Trek movie, this movie is more character and story driven instead of being over-reliant on visual effects. And again, it was made by people who had no prior knowledge of Star Trek, but at least they did their homework and in some cases improved on it, adding many tropes that would continue on for the remainder of the franchise. Star Trek II also had an interesting history that started with the aftermath of Star Trek The Motion Picture. Despite that film's underwhelming response from critics and the fact that it didn't really pull Star Wars numbers at the box office, as Paramount had hoped, since the movie was released at a time when every major studio was trying to cash in on Star Wars. The biggest complaint was the movie's budget, which at $44 million made it one of the most expensive movies ever made at that time, behind Liz Taylor's Cleopatra. The studio placed the blame squarely on Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry, who produced the motion picture. However, Paramount was interested in doing a sequel, but two things had to happen first. One, the budget had to be lower, and two, Roddenberry had to go. So Paramount kicked Roddenberry upstairs to a consultant position for future movies, a position he would hold until his death in 1991, and they enlisted legendary TV producer Harv Bennett to oversee the movie. When asked if he could do a Star Trek movie for less than $44 million, Bennett replied famously, where I'm from, I can do five movies for that. Bennett hadn't seen Star Trek before, so he did what any normal person would do today. He binged watched the whole series. During the binge watch, there was one episode that really stuck out to him, and that was the season one episode, Space Seed, which introduced Khan Noonien Singh, played by Ricardo Montalban, as a genetically engineered tyrant who was revived from a 200 year cryogenic sleep by Kirk and the Enterprise crew, only to have Khan try to take over the ship. The episode ended with Kirk marooning Khan and his followers on a planet, and it subliminally hinted at a possible future where we would find out the outcome of Kirk's decision. And that's when the light bulb went on and Bennett decided that we needed to see Khan again. And so began a series of script writing containing elements that not only included Khan, but there was one that introduced a new character called Dr. Savik, at the time a male Vulcan character, a story where Kirk meets his son, a terraforming device that could be used as a doomsday weapon, and the death of Spock. Leonard Nimoy at the time was allegedly trying to distance himself from Spock, not because he hated the character, as many seem to imply, but rather because he was not getting paid royalties for merchandising related to TOS. And he was initially planning not to return for Star Trek II because he did not have a pleasant time on the last movie. Bennett managed to lure him back with the promise of a death scene. However, Nimoy wasn't too thrilled with the finished script, despite liking the death scene, which came too early in the script. And also not thrilled with the finished script was William Shatner. This is where Nicholas Meyer comes in. At the time, Meyer was most famous for his Sherlock Holmes novel, The 7% Solution, which I did a video on a few years ago, and was just coming off his directorial debut, the 1979 film, Time After Time, which is about novelist H.G. Wells pursuing Jack the Ripper in then modern day San Francisco. He, like Bennett, had never seen Star Trek, but saw it as Horatio Hornblower in space. 
So he basically changed some elements of Star Trek to make it look like the Navy, including making the uniforms more like the futuristic version of Napoleonic era uniforms. The uniforms, which was my biggest gripe with the motion pictures, save for Kirk's Admiral uniform at the beginning of that movie, are greatly improved here and remain my favorite Star Trek uniforms with the first contact uniforms a close second. Upon taking the job of director, Nick Meyer rewrote the entire script taking elements from all the previous script attempts, including the death of Spock, Khan as the main villain, Kirk meeting his son, and the Doomsday Device, which was officially named Project Genesis. One major change was to the proposed new character, Dr. Savick, who was turned into a female character named Savick, spelled with two A's, and she was to be a protege of Spock's. Paramount set the budget for Star Trek II at 12 million way lower than the previous movie, so basically they had to cut corners where possible. The movie was filmed entirely on sound stages, and one cost-cutting measure, which every subsequent film until Generations would use, is the use of recycled visual effects shots from the previous movie. In this case, many of the recycled visual effects shots used in The Wrath of Khan were shots of the Enterprise from the first movie. With this move, the budget could be used mostly for the space battles. This movie also marked the introduction of the Miranda-class Starfleet vessel, which is best described as the Enterprise Upside Down, as the Reliant, which will be the antagonist ship. Since the Reliant and the Enterprise are both Starfleet vessels, they had to use the same sets. In the case of the Reliant, it was the bridge set. The set designers made it so that the Enterprise bridge could be taken apart and redesigned to be the Reliant bridge. With the original series cast back on board, Harv Bennett set about convincing Ricardo Montalban to reprise his role as Khan for the movie. Montalban, despite having a limited amount of time where he could do the movie due to him still working on Fantasy Island at the time, agreed. In order to get back into character as Khan so as not to be confused with Mr. Rourke, his character on Fantasy Island, Montalban requested a copy of Space Seed to watch. The other major addition to the cast was the then unknown actress named Kirstie Alley for the role of Savick, making her movie debut. Also up for the role was Kim Cattrall, who would later make her own contribution to the Star Trek franchise. It's also poignant that I bring this up, especially since we lost both Kirstie Alley and Nichelle Nichols last year. In fact, as was the case with Superman 3 last episode, only three members of the main cast are still alive. Ironically, they're also the only three actors that are still alive from the TOS era. William Shatner, George Takei, and Walter Koenig. Who, by the way, made a comeback of sorts earlier this year as the voice of Chekhov's son, who became president of the Federation in the series finale of Star Trek Picard. The movie went through numerous title changes during production. At one point, Nick Meyer wanted to call it The Undiscovered Country, in reference to some of the aging themes in the movie, example, Kirk's character arc in the movie, but he was overruled. Eventually, they settled on the title The Vengeance of Khan. However, it wasn't long before Lucasfilms came knocking on the door saying, you can't do that. We're calling our next Star Wars movie Revenge of the Jedi. And I know I made that joke last episode. So Paramount ultimately changed the title to The Wrath of Khan. Ironically, Lucasfilms would later change the title of the next Star Wars film to Return of the Jedi, because according to George Lucas, revenge is something a Jedi does not go after. To this day, I'm still not sure when I first saw Wrath of Khan, I was still too young to see it in theaters, but the year after that I saw it for the first time on VHS, and I owned it on a device called Video Discs, which I brought up in my Ode to My Childhood video. The only reason I'm showing the original Star Wars is to show you what Video Discs looked like back in the day, and yes, I also own the original Star Wars on Video Disc. Since then, this is one of my favorite movies growing up, and it's one of the movies I never get tired of, even to this day. But enough of my ramblings on the production of this movie. It's time to actually talk about the movie. So without further ado, here we go. The movie opens with the credits featuring music by the late, great James Horner, who starts out with the TOS fanfare before getting into his theme, which to this day is among the best work of his career and is in my top three favorite scores from him before we finally got to the official setting of the TOS era. Throughout TOS, it was kind of kept vague as to when Star Trek took place, but it is here where it's officially established that it was set in the late 23rd century, specifically the year 2285, 
It opens on the Enterprise Bridge, where we see the young Lieutenant Savick in command of the Enterprise, with the original bridge crew at their stations, where they receive a distress signal, which would require them to enter the neutral zone, and then they're attacked by three Klingon ships. Again, stock footage from the motion picture, where the entire bridge crew, including Spock, is killed before everything is revealed to be a simulation. The reason for this was at the time, someone, allegedly Gene Roddenberry, leaked that Spock was going to die. Remember, there was no internet at the time. And as a result, Nick Meyer started getting death threats. So basically, this scene was designed to disarm the audience, so that way when Spock actually did die later in the script, the audience wouldn't see it coming. Also, by the way, this is the origin of the Kobayashi Maru no-win scenario simulation in Star Trek. Of course, this will be referenced throughout the movie and in subsequent Star Trek-related media over the years, including one I will save for later in this review. As the simulation ends, a door opens where the Enterprise view screen is revealing Admiral James T. Kirk, who is an instructor at Starfleet Academy. The backstory for this, even though it's not really canon, is that following the motion picture, Kirk commanded the Enterprise for another five-year mission, before he decided to return to the Admiralty, while assigning the Enterprise to training duty with Spock as her new captain. There's actually a pretty good comic book limited series that was put out by Marvel in the late 90s, which covered this lost five-year mission that filled the gaps between the motion picture and the Wrath of Khan. After lecturing Savick on what she did wrong, it's established that it's Kirk's birthday. It's kept vague how old he is, but considering Shatner was 50 at the time of filming, it's implied that Kirk is also turning 50, and Kirk is not too thrilled about it. He received two symbolic gifts, a copy of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens from Spock, and a pair of 18th century spectacles from Dr. McCoy. The book is symbolic for its opening line, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times a line that bookends the whole movie, and the spectacles to symbolize Kirk's aging. During filming, Harv Bennett told Shatner to channel Spencer Tracy as far as aging gracefully goes. We also learn a little more about Kirk and that he has a hobby for collecting antiques, ranging from sailing ship models to a Commodore 64 computer, which at the time was brand new. Dr. McCoy knows Kirk is upset about aging and urges him to get back command of the Enterprise. Ironically, in the last movie, Bones was upset with Kirk because he was obsessed with regaining command of the Enterprise. And he was right. The difference between Kirk in the motion picture and Kirk here is that Kirk is much more resigned to the fact that his best years are seemingly behind him. And we come to the USS Reliant, which is on a scouting mission to find a barren planet to test out a device known as Project Genesis. We hear the log being read out by Pavel Chekhov, who is now first officer of the Reliant under Captain Clark Terrell, played by Paul Winfield. Chekhov informs Terrell that they found a life form on the planet they are orbiting. They beam down to the planet to investigate, and they stumble onto the remains of the ship Botany Bay, to which Chekhov reacts in horror. He and Terrell try to flee, but they are soon captured by a group of robed individuals, where the leader is revealed to be Khan Noonien Singh. And here's where we come to the only real plot hole of the movie. How does Khan know who Chekhov is? The first season episode, Space Seed, aired about six months before Walter Koenig joined the cast in season two. Probably the best known fan theory was that Chekhov was on board the Enterprise as a lower deck crewman before he was promoted to the bridge and had encountered Khan off screen. There's a long-standing joke that Chekhov kept Khan waiting for the bathroom a little too long. Also, while we're on this topic, Know who else wasn't in the episode? Sulu, making George Takei the only actor in both the TOS episode and this movie not to work directly with Ricardo Montalban. While interrogating Chekhov and Terrell, Khan goes into a long monologue over what happened since encountering Kirk and company after abandoning them on a planet that seemingly had life. Khan reveals that the planet the Reliant was supposedly orbiting was destroyed after the events of Space Seed, which rendered Khan's planet to become a desert wasteland. Khan then decided to plant Seti eels in the ears of both Chekhov and Terrell to control them. This scene might be frightening to little kids, and the PG-13 debate was going on at that time following Raiders of the Lost Ark, but this scene was not mentioned to make the case for the PG-13 rating. Khan then hijacks the Reliant, marooning the crew on their planet, and sets out for revenge on Kirk. Speaking of Kirk, he's on his way to the Enterprise to observe a training mission along with Dr. McCoy, Uhura, and Sulu. 
There was a scene cut from the movie establishing that Sulu was recently promoted to captain and that he was going to get command of the USS Excelsior. Spoiler, the ship will be introduced in the next movie, but Sulu won't officially get command until Star Trek VI. However, that scene was cut likely due to time. During the inspection, we also meet Peter Preston, who in the director's cut is established to be Scotty's nephew. I'll come back to him a little later. And when it's finally time for the Enterprise to leave Dry Dock, Spock allows Savick to take the ship out, and we get some more recycled effect shots from Star Trek The Motion Picture of the Enterprise leaving Dry Dock. While on the training mission, the Enterprise gets a distress signal from Space Laboratory Regular One, headed by Dr. Carol Marcus, an old flame of Kirk's, and the head of the Project Genesis experiment, accuses Kirk of attempting to steal their experiment, and ill-influenced Chekhov told him that Kirk ordered the Reliant to test the experiment out, the transmission is cut off by the Reliant before Kirk could get any more information. Before they can take action, Kirk must consult Spock on whether or not he should take command. And this is among the best scenes between the two friends. Spock plainly tells Kirk that it was a mistake for him to be promoted, and he belongs in command of the Enterprise. However, Nimoy was not thrilled with the setup for Spock's quarters, which he felt needed to be more mysterious and dark as befitting a Vulcan. But of course, that ended up being a moot point because the scene is so good. Spock obviously gives Kirk his blessing to assume command of the Enterprise and they go to warp speed. Meanwhile, Khan in command of the Reliant won't be dissuaded from his mission to get revenge on Kirk, quoting Ahab and Moby Dick as he goes into another monologue. And of course, it won't be the last time a Star Trek character would quote Moby Dick. See Star Trek First Contact for further details. This scene, as well as his introductory scene, is why Khan is considered not only the greatest villain in Star Trek history, but one of the greatest villains in movie history. His motivation is not taking over the world. It's been said that the greatest villains don't see themselves as the villains. And Khan fits into that saying really well. He's responding to what he feels was an injustice that was imposed on him and his followers. And while we're on the subject of Khan, the one question Nick Meyer is most asked about the movie is about Ricardo Montalban's pecs and whether or not they were real or a prosthetic. He responded that yes, that really was Montalban's chest. Would you believe these are the pecs of a then 61 year old man? While en route to the laboratory, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy watch the Genesis simulation, and we are treated to one of the first ever uses of CGI, done by Pixar, which was a Lucasfilm company at the time. Of course, now Disney owns both Lucasfilm and Pixar, and it was way better than anything nowadays. Of course, it leads to one of the most famous arguments between Spock and McCoy over the ethics of a terraforming device. Meyer often compares Spock to Sherlock Holmes, because both use logic to come to their conclusions. Spoiler, in Star Trek VI, Spock will quote Sherlock Holmes and acknowledge him as an ancestor of his. He'll also quote Sherlock Holmes again in Star Trek 2009. However, the argument is interrupted by the arrival of the Reliant. This scene is so cleverly crafted. The score by James Horner adds to the tension as the two ships move in on each other, the Enterprise not suspecting it's a trap, until Khan raises shields and fires phasers, seriously damaging the Enterprise before she can raise her shields. Kirk and Spock deduce that the Reliant knew where to hit them, but before they can act, the Reliant fires a torpedo causing damage to the bridge. Then Uhura tells Kirk that the Reliant is signaling them and ordering them to surrender. Kirk orders Uhura to put on screen, so Khan finally reveals himself to the Enterprise crew and Kirk offers to surrender himself to Khan, but Khan also wants Kirk to bring with him the data in regards to Project Genesis and gives Kirk a minute to comply. While pretending to give orders, Kirk and Spock secretly conceive a plan to use a command code that every ship has to order the Reliant to lower shields, which works, allowing the Enterprise to strike back, inflicting some damage, and forcing the Reliant to withdraw. After this, Kirk gets the full impact of how badly the Enterprise has been damaged when Scotty, for some unknown reason, brings his dying nephew up to the bridge. This is where I come back to what I said earlier about Peter Preston. The director's cut of the movie explains the story of Scotty's nephew and provides more motivation for Scotty's grief when the cadet dies. Whereas in the theatrical version, Scotty seems like he's grieving for some random crewmate. 
When it comes to this scene, the director's cut between Kirk explaining to Scotty why Khan attacked the ship and McCoy trying to comfort Kirk because this was his first real failure as captain and that they're only alive because Kirk knew something about the ships that Khan didn't. And that all works. I'm just surprised they didn't leave that in. I guess again, a lot of scenes were cut for time because you know they were also on a reduced budget. Oh well, moving on. The Enterprise just barely makes it to the space laboratory where Kirk, McCoy, and Savick beam over to investigate. At first it seems abandoned, but then they stumble upon a sea of dead bodies, all of them scientists. Probably the jump scare scene may have also scared little kids and probably would also have made the case for the PG-13 rating, which was going on at that time. They also find Terrell and Chekhov imprisoned in a storage container where they tell Kirk that Khan was at the station where he tortured and murdered the scientists off screen for information on Genesis. Fearing that Carol Marcus was among them, Kirk is relieved to find out that she had escaped with the Genesis device. So everyone beams down to the regular planetoid where Kirk is immediately attacked by Carol's son, David. Spoiler alert. David is Kirk's illegitimate son. After discovering Carol was alive, it's revealed that both Terrell and Chekhov are still under the influence of the eels and they both pull phasers on Kirk set to kill. Despite Khan's insistence that they go through with the assassination, Terrell ends up vaporizing himself while Chekhov passes out. Then we see the eel leave Chekhov's ear, another PG-13 moment, and Kirk vaporizes it. Still surprised that Kirk is still alive, Khan beams up the Genesis device and condemns Kirk and company to be marooned on Regula, as Kirk had condemned Khan and company to be marooned on their planet, which wound up killing his wife, Lieutenant MacGyver's from the Space Seed episode, and several of his followers. That, of course, is followed by the most famous scene in the movie. While stranded on the planet, Kirk and Carol have a heart-to-heart -heart moment where it was revealed that while she was pregnant, Carol told Kirk to stay away because she knew Kirk was the type to not stick around in one place too long, and she wanted David in her world rather than Kirk's. This is finally set up in the recent, though controversial, musical episode of Strange New Worlds, where Kirk tells Lalan, who is a descendant of Khan's, about Carol and her pregnancy. After Lan admits her true feelings for Kirk, even though she fell in love with an alternate reality version of Kirk in another episode of Strange New Worlds. He once again laments about getting old before Carol offers to show him something that'll make him feel young again. Of course, she's referring to what she accomplished on the Genesis Project. Apparently, she created an entire paradise hidden deep within a barren planet in a day. Also, throughout the movie, following Kirk lecturing Savick about her failure in the Kobayashi Maru simulation at the beginning of the movie, Savick has been pretty much hounding Kirk about how he handled the no-win scenario. Although we won't actually see it happen until Star Trek 2009, we finally learn that Kirk beat the no-win scenario by reprogramming the simulation. Or as David said, he cheated. With this bit of exposition, we get even more of an insight into Kirk's character as a man who, quote unquote, doesn't like to lose. No sooner does Kirk drop this little bit of information, they get a call from Spock saying that the Enterprise has restored enough power to beam them aboard. Earlier in the film, Spock told Kirk that it would take two days to restore power rather than the two hours in movie time that it actually took. The reason for this is that they knew Khan would be listening in, which he was, so they couldn't send uncoded messages on an open channel. So everyone is beamed back to the Enterprise and they come up with a plan to lure Khan into the Mutara Nebula, which would render shields useless and cloud visuals, which would even the odds against both ships. We also get our first glimpse into how a photon torpedo is loaded, a scene that Meyer referred to as the running out the gun scene. This is where a lot of the budget for the movie went and here you get your money's worth. 
The final confrontation between the Enterprise and the Reliant in the Mutara Nebula is still to this day considered one of the best sequences in the whole movie. Not to mention the whole franchise. The effects from Industrial Light and Magic still hold up to this day. Nick Meyer cited the film Run Silent, Run Deep, a submarine movie directed by the last movie's director, Robert Wise, as the inspiration for the tone of the final battle. During the battle, the Enterprise was able to inflict some serious damage on the Reliant while taking another hit along her torpedo bay. During the course of the battle, Spock deduces that Khan, despite being intelligent, only thinks two-dimensionally, and that will be his undoing. Chekhov recovers enough to assist the Enterprise crew in firing photon torpedoes. Khan, having lost most of his followers in the battle, is wondering where the Enterprise is, unaware that the Enterprise is sneaking up behind him. The Enterprise fires her torpedoes, taking out one of the Reliance nacelles. In that barrage, Khan is severely wounded, but still determined to defeat Kirk, proceeds to arm the Genesis device. David tells Kirk that once the device is activated, there is no stopping it. Kirk orders warp speed, but gets no response from engineering. Spock decides to leave the bridge without Kirk knowing it. Spock arrives in engineering and is stopped by McCoy, who is treating Scotty for radiation poisoning. However, Spock overpowers McCoy with a neck pinch and does a mind meld on him, where he says, remember, before entering the chamber. I'll come back to that little bit in a minute. While Spock is sacrificing himself in the warp core chamber, a dying Khan spouts more Moby Dick quotes at Kirk saying that he can't get away. He dies thinking that he had the satisfaction of taking Kirk with him. Unfortunately, Spock fixes the warp core in time for the Enterprise to warp out just before the Genesis device destroys the Reliant and starts creating the Genesis planet. Kirk attempts to praise Scotty for getting the warp core fixed, but is interrupted by McCoy telling him that he should get down to engineering right away. Also noticing that Spock's chair is also empty, Kirk races to engineering, only to find Spock dying from radiation poisoning. And what follows is, to this day, the best acting of Leonard Nimoy's career. I posted the clip of Spock dying the day Nimoy died in a little written post tribute to him on my blog site back in 2015. In fact, two of the most memorable quotes from the movie come from this scene. Spock tells Kirk that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few and I have been and always shall be your friend before dying. Both this scene and the subsequent funeral scene the first burial in space scene in the franchise are really moving. Kirk's eulogy where he describes Spock as the most human was some of Shatner's best line deliveries ever. There was some issue that some of the cast had with Kirstie Alley's decision to have Savick cry at Spock's funeral. The most vocal of this being Shatner saying, Vulcans aren't supposed to cry. Really, Bill? Spock got emotional how many times in the original series and even shed a tear in the last movie and he gets a free pass? And in the original script, Savick was supposed to be half Romulan, so her crying during the funeral would have been appropriate. And this kind of ties into my next point. Sometime before her death last year, Allie revealed that the real reason she didn't come back for Star Trek 3 was that the studio offered her less money for a larger role. And since her career was taking off at that time, mostly attributed to the success of this movie, she decided to walk away, leading to Robin Curtis replacing her in the next movie. And it was because of Allie's emotional performance that the producers had Curtis play Savick as more Vulcan-like. But that is a story for another time. So the Enterprise fires Spock's coffin torpedo into orbit around the new Genesis planet, which brings me back to the Remember scene. That was added in last minute by the second unit because initial screenings for the movie didn't go well, and Harv Bennett wanted to leave a window open for Spock to return in some way. And Leonard Nimoy was interested as well due to the fact that he had a much better time on this movie than he did on the last one. Nick Meyer on the other hand, was against it. And he refused to film the new scenes because he didn't believe in resurrections and turned down directing Star Trek 3 because of that. 
However, in a later DVD commentary on the movie, where I got my information for this review, Meyer remarked that he may have been overreacting. Because as we know, Meyer would come back to co-write Star Trek IV and direct Star Trek VI, both of which would have Spock in it. After the funeral, Kirk and his son David have a heart-to-heart -heart where David acknowledges that he is proud to be Kirk's son. And we end the movie with Kirk and company looking at the Genesis planet where McCoy asks Kirk how he feels. And Kirk responds that he feels young, which bookends the movie where Kirk is lamenting about growing old at the beginning and now after losing his friend but gaining a son, he is ready to come back to life again. We also see the second unit shot of Spock's torpedo coffin on the planet's surface and Spock does the space, the final frontier monologue, normally said by Kirk before every episode of TOS. Star Trek II was ultimately released on June 4th, 1982 and in its first weekend dethroned then box office champ Rocky III in its first weekend of release and would ultimately go on to gross 78 million domestically which was slightly lower than Star Trek The Motion Picture, but since its budget was only $12 million, it was more profitable and it ended up being one of the biggest hits of the year. Granted that the year was dominated by E.T., but critically it was a success. There really isn't much to say about the performances which were great all around, most notably Shatner, Nimoy, and especially Montalban who again elevates Khan into the pantheon of greatest movie villains ever. Kirstie Alley is great in her official movie debut and the rest of the crew also do well. Nicholas Meyer did an excellent job directing this movie. The story is excellent, the effects are excellent, and above all else, this movie still holds up no matter how much people parody it, pay homage to it, and in the case of Into Darkness, blatantly rip it off. In the end, over 40 years later, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is still the greatest Star Trek movie ever. I enjoyed it a lot as a kid and I still enjoy it today. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in my top 10 favorite movies of all time list. Now that you mention it, 2023 has been a good year for Star Trek. Between the continued success of Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, and especially Picard Season 3, I feel like they finally righted the ship, and as the franchise nears its 60th anniversary, I have high hopes for the franchise going forward. Mm -hmm.